Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the CUNY Graduate Center. I want to make a special welcome to people that are here in person and um, and traveled to get here, and also welcome every everyone online. Um, before I introduce our speaker, let me thank a few people. My co-organizer, who is Miles Studenmeyer, and also thank him for the wonderful talk on Tuesday. And other people that helped organize, uh, Goen, Minshaw, and Vadim, the director of ITS, is here. And thank David Spurgel and the folks at Simons Foundation for uh, their support, which helped make things like this possible. So Miles talked a little bit in the tutorial and gave uh, some idea that certain, for certain kinds of computations, actually maybe you don't need a quantum computer to to execute certain quantum algorithms if you have tensor networks. But uh, on the flip side, Michael Foss Feig has a quantum computer. And what can you do in that case if you actually have a quantum computer and you want to use some tensor network methods? So I would uh, like to, to welcome Michael uh, from Colorado, who made some Herculean efforts to get here uh, last night, who has uh, come from the Army Research Lab and is now at uh, Quantinium, which is spun out of Honeywell. So Michael, I'm very happy to have you here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Very happy to be here. Yeah, so thanks. Um, I, um, this is a pretty good, introduction to my talk already so I can mostly skip it the uh um but yeah so I work for a quantum computing a quantum computing hardware company um, we have a relatively small theory effort um and one of the things that we're working on is trying to understand uh, how we can get some of the benefits of both uh quantum computing and also uh, tensor network techniques kind of merge together um, and actually, ideally, in the long run, be able to use uh, tensor network techniques on quantum computers to do calculations um, of, of the properties of quantum systems that you couldn't do even with classical tensor network techniques. Um, and yeah, so the, the, the company is Quantinium. We used to be Honeywell Quantum Solutions. Um, and like I said, we're primarily a hardware company. So we build trapped ion-based quantum computers. I'll take um, let's see, I'll, I'll try to spend maybe like 10 minutes at most talking about our quantum computers, just to give people a sense of, um, uh, the technical capabilities that they have, um, for those that are interested. Uh, once I get through that, um, I'll, I'll give kind of a brief overview of, of what I'm calling quantum matrix product states or quantum tensor networks. Um, and, um, there's many different ways of thinking about what that is. Um, but I'll give kind of one, uh, Kind of nice uh, viewpoint, which is that you can think of a quantum uh, matrix product state as a mapping of the spatial structure of a matrix product state onto the temporal direction of a quantum circuit. Um, and, and by hiding kind of, you know, one spatial dimension into the time direction of a circuit, one of the big advantages is that you can study relatively large systems, even with pretty small quantum computers. Um, and I'll, I'll then go on to talk about an algorithm for how you could, if you have a uh, quantum matrix product state on a quantum computer, or if you can generate one on a quantum computer, how you could then uh, time evolve such a state to study kind of non-equilibrium dynamics. Um, one reason that that's interesting is that it's hard even for classical tensor network techniques or hard in some sense. Um, and uh, it turns out that you kind of maintain a lot of the qubit efficiency that you get through this space to time mapping when you do that on a quantum computer. Um, let's see, and then I'll give, I'll, I'll wrap up with an actual example of how you can make this work on a quantum computer. Uh, so I'll be talking about work that I did not do myself. So Ellie, uh, who's uh, actually, he did this when he was an intern at, at um, when we were still Honeywell Quantum Solutions. Now he's a research scientist at Quantinium, uh, but he actually, did all this work, but it's also a good advertisement that we have an intern program. So if people are interested in quantum computing, uh, reach out to me. Okay. So, whoops, sorry. So um, the way our quantum computers work 
is uh, we fabricate these devices, these ion traps. And what you're seeing here is um, if you look at, let's see, my mouse shows up, yeah. So all of these little kind of dark patches here in the middle um, that look kind of like a piano keyboard, each one of those is an independent electrode that we control the voltage on. So we can apply time dependent voltages to all of those little electrodes. And so you can imagine, you know, skipping all the details that by doing that, we can kind of generate electrostatic trapping potentials above the surface of this trap. And we can control dynamically where they are in time. And uh, our qubits are singly ionized deuterium atoms. Um, so they have electric charge and we can then trap them in this electrostatic potential above the surface of a trap. So uh, every qubit is a single ionized deuterium atom. We're able to dynamically reposition them over the surface of the trap. Um, one, so for people that are sort of interested, uh, but it's not honestly all that important, our actual qubit is basically uh, determined by the single valence electron in that deuterium atom, whether it's electron, it's electric, uh, uh, whether it's spin kind of points along or against the nuclear spin which is also, uh, so you have a little spin one half electron, a spin one half nucleus, and then the uh, the spin triplet and spin singlet states are what we call one and zero for our qubits in the quantum computer. And the nice thing about these qubits is just that they have uh, a very stable energy splitting that's pretty insensitive to magnetic fields. And for us, that just means they have a very long coherence time. So if you store some information in that qubit, people have shown that it can stick around for even many minutes or hours. Uh, for us, it's a little bit less than that, but it's still quite long. Uh, the, so you probably noticed that this trap looks kind of 1D-ish, um, and it is essentially 1D. We trap all of our qubits along just a line above the surface of the trap. Um, but one important, um, thing to keep in mind is that by controlling the position of all of the kind of electrostatic potentials that hold these ions, we can do all kinds of transport maneuvers, right? We can take a crystal of two qubits, we can split it apart into two different wells. We can also rotate those wells around each other and then keep moving them. We can you know, shift things left and right. And so it turns out that those primitives of splitting things apart, putting them together, rotating things past each other and shifting left to right allow you to arbitrarily rearrange a bunch of qubits on a line. So even though they're laid out on a line, if you, know, you can kind of think of uh, this system as being able to gate arbitrary pairs of qubits, because if we've just gated, you know, like these two qubits over here, and then you say, okay, now I want to gate this one with a qubit that's way over on the other side of the trap. We don't have to apply any quantum logic in order to do uh, like the transfer of information from this side to this side. We just physically move that ion over to where the other one is, and then we do a gate between them. And so we can do, you know, just directly do gates between arbitrary pairs of qubits. It comes at, it's not completely free. It comes at the cost of, it takes time to do that transport. And you do suffer some small memory errors during that time. But because we have a very long-lived um, qubit, it's a relatively small uh, price to pay. And actually, it turns out to be kind of negligible for us right now. Um, what's shown here is these, um, it, you know, as these blue regions are the gate zones. So this is really a feature of the optics that are external to the trap. So we do our gates with lasers. And those are aligned to kind of intersect at these five different places along the trap. Um, so we have five physical locations where we can do the gates. That's really not so much a property of the trap, uh, or it's not entirely a property of the trap. It's largely a property of, of the optics that are external to it. So how many gate zones you have, and therefore how many qubits you can effectively address in parallel is something that we can kind of upgrade over time by improving our optics. Um, and that's, that's something we have done. This trap, you know, the, the first day it came online, it had one qubit, which was like super exciting, but also kind of like, well, what do you do with one qubit? And now, you know, that was a year and a half ago or something. Now we have 20 qubits and it in principle can hold more. Um, let's see. Other other kind of important high level things. If you know what this means, um, that's great, but it's not important if you don't. Our, our two qubit gate is what's called the Molmer Sorensen gate. This is kind of the workhorse gate of all trapped ions. Uh, the only thing really important that you need to know about it is that the way it works um, is you shine lasers on the ion, and those lasers push the ion around depending on the internal state, the qubit state that it's in. And then if those two ions are in a single well, so that their motion is coupled by the Coulomb interaction, then if you push one ion depending on its state, it pushes the other ion because of the Coulomb interaction, and the other ion is also being pushed because of it due to its internal state, 
then effectively you can probably believe that you get some kind of internal coupling between the states of those two ions. And it turns out you do, and you can generate a pretty high fidelity gate uh, that way, two qubit gate. Um, the one thing that's very nice about this architecture, um, and maybe I can I can contrast it to um, the way that most people do quantum computing with trapped ions is you put all of your qubits in a single crystal, like a single long chain where they're all in one big potential well. That's nice because every qubit talks to every other qubit via the Coulomb interaction. So you can directly implement long range gates without even moving the qubits around in space. The price you pay uh, is that because they're all crowded into the same potential well, you have in principle, um, you could maybe avoid it, but in practice, you have a lot of crosstalk between the different ions. When you try to address just one, you inevitably hit others. In this architecture, when we do a gate, we've actually split you know, two qubits off away from everybody else, and they're relatively well isolated. They're kind of hundreds of microns away from everything else, which is a lot on kind of optical length scales. So we can really address just two qubits in a very precise way without having to worry about crosstalk. And that lets us do higher fidelity operations with, with lower crosstalk. Um, and so one really nice thing that that buys us is that we can even do, so probably the hardest operation to do on a single qubit without impacting everything else is measurement and reset. Because these are, since they're non-unitary operations, they kind of involve opening the qubit up to the environment. And inevitably that's a very destructive process. It involves, you know, shining resonant light into the ion. And that's something that any nearby ion is going to be very sensitive to. So to make that work without, you know, if you want to measure one qubit without accidentally measuring everything else, it's important that you can isolate them. And this ability to dynamically move them apart to get good spatial isolation for kind of low crosstalk measurements, but then move them together to get nice, you know, strong coupling for high fidelity gates. That's really kind of what we get from this architecture. Um, let's see. And I, I, and, uh, can gates in different zones be applied in parallel? They can be, yeah. Yeah, so the, the five zones shown, all the gates would be applied in parallel. And the yeah. measurements also? Right? Measurements can also be applied in parallel, yeah. Um, and, you know, I talk about this stuff so much that I probably didn't do justice of crediting all of the ideas here to people other than us. So if you... If you've never heard of this architecture before and you think that, you know, we invented it or something, we certainly didn't. This is, you know, these are ideas that go back to like the late 90s or early 2000s uh, at NIST. So there's been a, there's like a gazillion references about all this stuff that I haven't mentioned. Um, so just should point that out. Yeah. So you, you mentioned fidelity several times. So when, you, when for you, good fidelity is 99.999? Yeah. Oh, so I'll tell you. Tell you on the oh, next slide. Yeah. yeah. But it's the same also for measure. Like, you know, yep. Your ability. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll give you, I think I'll tell you everything you want to know. Uh, well, right. we'll see. <laughs> uh, so, okay, here's some data characterizing the kind of key metrics of how well the device works or some of the key metrics. Um, so, what these plots show, it's not super important, but I'll give you just a flavor of how we measure this. You know, in this plot, what's being scanned on the x-axis is the number of random gates you apply. So in this case, it's single qubit gates. So you take one qubit, you apply a bunch of random gates. And then what you look at is if the qubit starts in zero, you ask what's the probability that after that sequence, if the sequence is designed to return it to the zero state, what's the probability that it actually does? And the nice thing is that that kind of amplifies the error of the gate in, in that you can sort of extract the error per gate by just looking at the you know, decay of an exponential decay curve as a function of the gate sequence. So it's just a nice way of measuring the kind of per gate fidelity, even if it's very high. Um, and so for single qubit gates, we can, by fitting this decay to you know, an exponential, we can, we can see that we get fidelities of roughly kind of four nines or better. So 99.99 plus a little bit for single qubit gates. Um, for two qubit gates, we typically get fidelities that are not quite at the level of 99.9%. Um, kind of 99.7 to 99.8 currently. But I think the the technical limit on this that has been demonstrated in the field for two qubit gates is roughly 99.9. .9, and that's kind of what we're steadily pushing towards. And then I think the nice thing about trapped ions is that I think it's relatively reasonable to expect that we can push that to 99.99. .99, so kind of four nines of fidelity on two qubit gates without heroic efforts. I think there are ideas out there that are very reasonable for how to do that, I think. That's right. Yeah. So this is a device with 20 qubits in it, checking the fidelity on all of them. Yeah. 
So there's some of the qubits are some reason detected, or not, not as good as the others. Yeah, so there's inevitably there's some variance. Um, but it's not really a property of the qubits being less good. It's more a function of uh, like the optical quality in the zone where they're being gated. The qubits are all exactly the same, basically. Right. So the the fact that there's any dependence here is really a property of, say, the trap and the optics, not the ions. Well, yeah, that's what I'm confused about because you, I thought you said that there are five places where the qubit operations are happening. Yeah. But it seems to me that there should be groups of five and not like yeah. two, two of them just sticking out. Just well, but it's also, there's more to it than that because if you have 20 qubits and you're gating them in five zones, you have to do a lot of shuffling around between the gates and exactly who gets shuffled how much depends on who you are. Um, but yeah. Um, and then, oh, and then also what's called spam fidelity here. This means basically spam fidelity, state preparation and measurement it stands for. It's like, if I tell you to put a qubit in the zero state and then measure and verify that it's in the zero state, how often do you successfully do that and get the right answer? That's what spam fidelity is. And it's about, it's the same as the two qubit gate fidelity, roughly. It tells you that if you prepare zero and then measure zero, you will wrongly measure one only like two out of a thousand times, roughly. Um, okay. So, uh, okay, almost at the end of describing this stuff, I think the only thing I wanted to um, emphasize before moving on uh, is that we've gone through fairly heroic efforts to really isolate the qubits when they're being measured. And I kind of alluded to this before, but the reason we do that is measurement is intrinsically a very destructive process, right? It involves kind of opening up the qubit to the environment. We do that by shining resonant light on that drives uh, scattering if you're in one of the qubit states, but not the other. And so you can think about what could go wrong during a measurement is maybe I intend to just measure qubit A, but you know my laser beam isn't this like perfect you know narrow thing. It has some tails, and you might accidentally measure qubit B just a little bit with some very small probability when you don't mean to. Um, and I think actually in the interest of time, just because I spent more than I wanted on this, I won't say too many details about that. Other than uh, when we go to measure one qubit we can ensure that the probability of accidentally measuring anything else is kind of below the 10 to the minus four level. So we can drive that crosstalk to be low enough that you don't really have to worry about it. So you can think of it as just a kind of given capability of this device that in the middle of a circuit, you can measure one qubit or a fixed subset of the qubits with no real error on the other qubits. You don't accidentally measure anything else that you didn't mean to. Okay. Um, so let me just take a brief pause then before everything else will be really more about um, kind of quantum tensor networks and not about the hardware. So if people have questions before uh, moving on, you know, feel free to stop me or ask. Uh, do you understand like why some of those qubits were like at much more fidelity, fidelity like which ones they were? Like what was the ordering of that? Like, In here? Um, Uh, the safest answer is no. Um, I think it's not even entirely clear to me that this result would be all that repeatable. So when we when we quote these fidelities, we typically give kind of, you know, like upper bounds on the air. And for single qubit gates, I think we often just don't worry about them that much, because even if you look at the worst offenders, you can upper bound the errors as like roughly one E minus four. And so it as a result of that, they're always so much below the two qubit gate errors that we kind of think of them as free, like perfect, the single qubit gates. Um, I, if, if I had to guess, there are probably repeatable differences between the five different zones based on like the optical quality of the beams in that zone. So you might see some repeatable discrepancies from that. And you'd probably also see some discrepancies that are due to like how well the polarizations were calibrated in this zone versus that one. It might be a little bit different from like, you know, Tuesday to Thursday or something. But generally, they're always kind of above some minimum threshold that makes them good enough to not worry about. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, what are the, the time scales on these physical systems? Like, how long does it take you to apply a one qubit or a two qubit case or something? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, so all of the all of the kind of primitive operations um, turn out to be roughly like one to a hundred microseconds. They're kind of in that range of timescales. 
like two cubic gates are, I think, tens of microseconds. Um, one important thing to keep in mind is that if I like, if you want to gate two qubits and then gate two other qubits later, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen between that involving transport and cooling, um, like sympathetic cooling, which is something I didn't even mention. And that all takes a lot of time. So um, in reality, the, the you know, how much time passes between layers of gates is more than you would think from that 10 microsecond two qubit gate. It turns out to be more in the kind of low milliseconds uh, range. So that low milliseconds is kind of ultimately what sets like the time per layer of gates in a quantum circuit that you have to think about. I didn't understand the part about cooling. So when you move the qubits around, you have to like stop and let them cool back down. Uh, we don't stop and let them cool. We we co-trap a sympathetic cooling ion that we laser cool, and through its Coulomb interaction with the qubit, it, it sympathetically cools the qubit. But you have to do that. The two qubit gates work better if the ion is in its motional ground state prior to the gate. And you actually excite them. Not much, but enough that matters. If you if you didn't do any cooling over a long circuit, you would the gate fidelity would degrade. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so I'll start off with a very high level description of what I mean by a quantum tensor network. And then I'm gonna jump into a very concrete example with the matrix product state. Um, and so I think it sounds like everybody, probably most people at least have some background in tensor networks or went to the seminar. Um, so hopefully some of this is familiar material. Um, but you know, a tensor network is really a efficient classical description of a quantum state, right? And what I mean when I say a quantum tensor network is to take a state that has a nice description as a classical tensor network and find a quantum circuit that generates that state. So a quantum tensor network is really a quantum circuit that is tailored to generate states that are described by classical tensor networks. That's essentially all I mean. Um, now, there are a bunch of different types of tensor networks that you could imagine building with a quantum circuit in an efficient way. Um, one of, in, in some sense, actually, one of the most natural is probably is not the simplest, but um, so a tensor network known as Omera, which is this kind of hierarchical tensor network that's good at describing kind of critical states of matter. Um, it actually was kind of initially envisioned as a quantum circuit. It is like it is kind of defined naturally in terms of a quantum circuit that takes in a bunch of qubits in the zero state and in this kind of tree-like pattern, gates them and then outputs a quantum state. Um, so, so this is kind of a relatively natural, um, you know, quantum tensor network. If you think of it as just like you know contraction of a bunch of classical tensors, it's a classical tensor network. If you think of it as the quantum circuit that takes in qubits in the zero state. And then instead of having tensors, it applies gates described by those tensors to those qubits and outputs the quantum state. It's a quantum tensor network. Um, it turns out um, it, it's far less obvious in some respect, but matrix product states can also be, even though they weren't envisioned in this way, they've been known for a long time to be expressible as quantum circuits. Um, in general, um, you know, 2D tensor networks like PEPs, it, I think it's pretty well no, or it's it's relatively well established that we would not expect any low depth circuit to form a good approximation of all PEPs. They're in some sense too complicated to be captured even by quantum computers. Um, so there should be no low depth circuits that capture all PEPs, but there are subclasses of PEPs that can be written down as relatively low depth quantum circuits. So there are some subclasses of PEPs that are also uh, nicely expressible as quantum tensor networks. Um, and then, you know, I guess the big question is why would we want to do this? Um, the short answer is that, you know, even though classical tensor network techniques are very powerful, they don't solve everything that we would like to be able to solve about, you know, quantum systems. There are still kind of questions that we'd like to address that we don't know how to with classical tensor network techniques. Um, and one way of thinking about the whole, you know, what we're going kind of going after in the work that I'm going to talk about is that we're trying to take those classical tensor network techniques tensor network techniques, put them on a quantum computer with the hope, and we have some reasonable expectation for this hope, that the quantum computer can then kind of boost the ability of that classical tensor network calculation so we can get beyond the limits that you have classically by using a quantum computer. All right, so with that kind of brief motivation, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of dive in and give a simple example of how this actually works. Um, so uh, 
let's see. So, you know, I think everybody's familiar with an MPS, but I'll give like a one minute overview anyway. So the idea of an MPS is that we have some correlated state. And in general, if it has low entanglement entropy, um, then it turns out that you can that you can describe it by a relatively simple onset, so matrix product state with a relatively low bond dimension. So here's what all of those statements actually mean. So this state um, is formed by you know contracting a bunch of virtual legs of tensors. So this little block here, it's a you know three index tensor. So it has these two virtual dimensions labeled by alpha and beta, one physical dimension that actually labels like the physical degree of freedom of you know a qubit living on this site for the state. And then, you know, if you fix, say you fix all the physical legs coming out to like 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, then the contraction of this tensor network with all of those legs fixed uh, tells you the amplitude of the state in that computational basis state. So that's what the tensor uh, network is doing. Um, a couple of key properties of an MPS is that the number of kind of values that you let these virtual legs run over, which we call the bond dimensions, they go from one to chi controls how expressive that state is. And very roughly, you can think about it as with bond dimension chi, you can represent any state that has uh, sufficiently low entanglement entropy. So entropy less than the log of the bond dimension. Um, and ultimately, the thing that makes this a good ansatz for 1D states is that 1D states um, tend to have low entanglement entropy. OK. So if you want to turn this tensor network into a quantum circuit, um, I think the first obvious problem you run into is quantum circuits are built out of unitary building blocks, right? They ingest qubits and they put out the same number of qubits. So a, a gate between two qubits should be a four-legged tensor, right? It should take in two qubits, put out two qubits. That is not what, you know, the tensors in an MPS look like. Um, but you can think of this tensor as being embedded in a higher, in, you know, a tensor with one more index where you just fix that index to be something. Right, so I can embed this tensor in a matrix that has now, you know, four or in a tensor that um, has two indices coming in for two qubits in, two indices coming out for two qubits out. The fact that you can always embed it in a tensor that is unitary is not obvious, but it's a fact that is true about matrix product states. It's it, it's not trivial, but it's true. Um, and so, at the end of the day, what that means is that I can. I can always think of this tensor um, as being basically uh, the the amplitude or as as being related to the amplitudes um, of states going into and out of this unitary U that's shown here, where one of the input states is fixed to be zero. And so notice that this unitary takes in and puts out a physical index, and then it also takes in and puts out kind of a bond index. So this unitary is acting on one qubit because sigma ranges over zero and one. And then a Q dit that ranges, you know, that has a Hilbert space dimension of chi. So basically, we're embedding this kind of, you know, bond dimension, this bond space of the tensor network into a kind of actually realized Hilbert space of, of dimension chi that this unitary acts on. And so you can kind of think of it as this picture over here. This unitary in just one qubit always fixed to the zero state. And that's to deal with the fact that we have, you know, no left index coming out of this tensor. And then it ingests, uh, you know, a, a state of kind of log two chi um, qubits representing the bond space as a physically realized Hilbert space, and it outputs uh, state. So there's kind of an exact mapping between this tensor and this unitary process. Okay. So if you want to build up the entire matrix product state, then the way that would work is you would start off with all of your uh, physical qubits in the zero state and this kind of bond register that I showed, this register shown right down here, initialized in the zero state. And you would first implement this tensor as a unitary between the bond space and the first physical qubit. And then you would sweep the bond qubit down. You can kind of think of this line running down through the tensor network as the time direction of this circuit, where the unitary is being swept across all of the physical qubits. And the claim that I'm making, and this is something that you know was shown by um, people, you know, what, 15 years ago now, um, is that the state that comes out of this quantum circuit is exactly this matrix product state if you choose these unitaries in proper correspondence with the tensors of this matrix product state. So you're able to generate any matrix product state with this relatively simple uh, quantum circuit is the claim. Um, 
Um, okay, so first question you might ask is, you know, what do you actually gain uh, by doing this? And, um, you know, one answer is that it's just a nice onsets for physically useful states, right? Matrix product states, we know, capture the properties of lots of kind of physical systems. So like low energy states of uh, 1D kind of local Hamiltonians. Um, and this is just a nice, you know, relatively simple onsets that would let you prepare such states on a quantum computer. Um, but you actually get quite a bit more than this. Um, and let me let me kind of show you what you can do to simplify this circuit with a slightly smaller example of just a four qubit state. So imagine you want to prepare this state, but all you want to do after you've prepared it is you want to measure the output qubits. So you this would be equivalent to like, I want to know the correlation functions of my MPS or something. I'd make a bunch of local measurements like this. So it's a fairly general thing you might want to do. Um, so first thing you can notice is that this first measurement shown up here on the top Nothing is happening between the time when this two qubit, when this gate over here is applied and when this qubit is measured, right? So you can move this measurement all the way back in time. It's not crossing anything until right after this unitary is applied. And what that means is that you can measure this qubit before you even need to inject the second qubit um, in the preparation scheme for this state, right? Because if I measure this first qubit right here, this gate hasn't been applied yet, so I never even needed this qubit. So I actually can I can think of this circuit as a process where I first injected these qubits and a single qubit. I executed this gate, and then I measured this qubit, and I reset it to the zero state, and I call it the second qubit. So I didn't actually need the second qubit. Now I can inject that second qubit into this gate right here. At that point, I'm free to measure it. Um, oh, sorry, I, well, I got a little ahead of myself. But the point is I can rewrite the circuit in a way that doesn't actually use the second qubit at all, right? I can measure the first qubit, I can reset it to the zero state, and then I can inject it into the second gate. Now I can repeat that process, right? So I can measure the next qubit before I need to apply this gate, and therefore before I need the third qubit. So I don't need the third qubit either. So I can measure the second qubit, I can re-inject it, I can reset it to zero and inject it as the third qubit, I can do the same thing for the fourth qubit. And so at the end of the day, I can measure any property of the state that I want, kind of any local measurements I want on the state, or I can learn all correlation functions, for example, um, using only a single physical qubit and uh, this bond register of qubits. So it's kind of drawn in a funny way now, but um, if you just rearrange that circuit with all these loops, it looks just like this, right? What it actually ends up being is just a bond register that interacts sequentially with the same qubit over and over again. That qubit is measured and then always reset before interacting again with the bond qubit. And now, you know, measurements at, at well, I think I actually kind of drew the correspondence here. Um, yeah, sorry, let me just jump ahead. So measurements at different points in space of the matrix product state end up getting mapped onto measurements at different times during the quantum circuit. So Essentially, I started with this state that had, you know, in principle, arbitrarily many degrees of freedom. It could have been a kind of, you know, infinitely large 1D system. And I've, I'm able to learn all the information I want to know about it, like its correlation functions, by using a circuit that acts only on log 2 chi qubits, so a number of qubits that you need to represent the bond space, and then a single physical qubit independent of system size. Yeah. So what qubits in gray do you have up there? Which, these ones up here? Oh, these ones. Right, so these are, if we go all the way back, those are the qubits that represent the bond space of the MPS. So if you go back to whoop, to this representation, right, we had to embed this tensor that has, in principle, a very, you know, like, large rank in this um, direction, um, or, or, you know, alpha can go from one to a large number. Um, and so the way we do that is we let this unitary act on a number of qubits that's like log two chi, so that it has a Hilbert space large enough to encompass the bond space. So these qubits that are later drawn as kind of, you know, in the shaded gray, are the qubits that represent the bond space of the MPS. And so um, really the only important consequence of that is that uh, the number of qubits you need to run this circuit is really dominated by the cost of representing this bond space. And it goes like um, the log of chi 
which is proportional to the entanglement entropy of the state. So you can think of it as the end of the at the end of the day as you need a number of qubits living up here in this kind of register uh, representing this kind of virtual dimension of the of the MPS that scales just linearly with the entanglement entropy of the state you're trying to represent. Will they entangle at the end of the rest of the qubits? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Can I, uh, uh, Generically, yes. Um, it turns out that they don't need to be, but let, let me ask, ask me later. I'll just avoid answering it because it doesn't have a super easy answer. Um, but effectively, you can think, yes, you can always ensure that they're disentangled at the end. And so you're really like, pure you're, you're generating a pure state on the qubits that you on the physical qubits. Yeah. Yeah. So just to make sure I understand correctly. So if you have 20 qubits, you can make 19 of them the physical dimension. Well, for this, I would. That's like a MPS with bond dimension greater than nineteen. Yeah, so I would call it. I can. Yeah, I, I use a slightly different language. I would say we can make nineteen of them the bond qubits and one of them the physical qubit. Yeah. yeah. That one gets reused over and over again. So yeah, we can rep with twenty qubits. You can measure correlation functions of an MPS with two to the nineteen bond dimension. Yeah. So it's like bond dimension five hundred thousand and an yeah. arbitrary number of physical sets. In principle, yeah. In principle. Yeah. Yeah. But don't you need that, so like the gray box should be also all inserted in that? I think that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great point. So, in general, so the statement is there. Oh yeah. So I think I think what you were saying is, doesn't this gray box need to you know be in general some arbitrary unitary? Yeah. And the answer is yes. And if you ask what is the circuit depth required to build an arbitrary unitary, it's generally going to be exponential in the number of qubits or polynomial in the bond dimension. Mm -hmm. So worst case, it could be that the quantum complexity, like the circuit depth needed to realize that this MPS is as bad as the classical complexity. It could be polynomial in the bond dimension. Mm -hmm. So um, you might then worry that you're not really getting any benefit out of doing this. But I think there's pretty good reason to believe that there's still a benefit to be had. And I'll give one example of where that's true, because like one thing you might want to do is start in a state with some relatively low amount of entanglement entropy where these unitaries are well known and relatively small, like living in a small bond space and then do, a you know, kind of quench dynamics on top of it. And it turns out that if you do that, even though the entanglement kind of grows ballistically in time, uh, there's no the, the kind of circuit complexity or the depth uh, is not impacted by that. It's still just growing linearly with the time evolution. So there are places where MPS that have, you know, very large bond dimension can be basically guaranteed to be expressible as quantum circuits that are low depth, as long as you start with relatively low entanglement entropy. Um, so that's kind of the, that that's like the angle that I'll focus on in the rest of the talk. But I think even for ground, even for ground states, if you just care about ground states with a large amount of entanglement entropy, there are some arguments um, that, you know, MPS actually have a lot more information content. Uh, like an MPS with bond dimension chi, in some sense, has too much uh, expressive content. And that very kind of sparse MPS should be compatible with most physical ground states. And therefore, you might expect that while in the worst case, these unitaries are very hard to represent, they're actually not always that hard to represent. So that's a little more speculative. Um, but I think there is some reason to be optimistic about that. But time evolution gets around that problem completely, I would say. Sorry, can I ask? Uh, maybe somebody already asked this. So in the usual MPS, you know, the, the, the readouts is what I care to compute correlators. And the quantum state of log base 2 of the pi of these in qubits doesn't ever show up. Whereas here, it seems like with every run of this, you get a different measurement measurement outcomes. You'll have a different state of the thing qubits. Uh yep. What's what's the physics of that? Sorry, yeah. What is the physics of that? Um what is the state of the encoding of the stuff that lives in the bond event? Uh, that's an output of the circuit, right? It is. So I, I I really want to avoid talking about this. Not not because I'm not happy to, but because I think it'll take too much time. Um let there is a way of ensuring, if you know the MPS you're trying to create, there is a way of ensuring that that bond register just disentangles at the end. So just think of it as like coming out and leaving everything in a pure state. Oh, no, no, I'm not worried about that. Yeah. I'm curious, like, with every different realization of the measurement outcomes, 
that state is different. So I'm just curious what the ensemble. Uh, well, if it, technically no, right? If it if it disentangles, if you go back to this picture where this is truly um, like a you know a circuit acting on all of the qubits, like forget about the measurement and reset. Like look at this circuit. If this actually disentangles here, then the state of this is independent of you know like anything conditioned on these qubits. All right, thanks. No, that's yeah. Thanks. Okay. There's a lot here. I mean, it's kind of confusing, but I think the important takeaway is just that, I mean, you you phrased it nicely, John, that like you can take all of your qubits and you can push them into representing the entanglement entropy of the state. And the actual physical size of the state is kind of irrelevant to the number of qubits you need to represent it. You only need one qubit for all of the physical lattice sites, plus a number proportional to the entanglement entropy. Yep. But like you, that unit thing you had, so I think this is also the question that yeah. was being asked before. Um, I'll, so let me just show you an example. Maybe let me answer with an example about what happens for dynamics. In general, that's a very legitimate concern. Um, and I think there are like honest answers to that, which involve, which amount to, I don't think it kills this as a viable idea in general. But I think they're not like completely well under like the answer to that question is not completely well understood, I would say. I don't think. Uh, not by me at least. Um okay. So another way of kind of summarizing what you're getting here, if you think about in classical tensor networks, you know, what do they get you? At least um, you know, if you represent any state as a matrix product state, you can ask what is what benefit do you get? And the real benefit is that. You know, the, the size of the Hilbert space is exponential in the number of qubits. So naively, you would think that sets the complexity of simulating, an, you know, an n qubit quantum system. And matrix products, they tell you that that's not true, right? The actual difficulty of expressing a state is only exponential in the entanglement entropy of that state, not in the number of qubits that it has. And so on the quantum side, you can think of, you know, representing a state of n qubits by brute force obviously just requires n qubits, right? You just like generate the state on those n qubits. Um, but by using tensor network ideas, we're able to reduce that to uh, entanglement entropy number of qubits needed in this bond register. So it's kind of like on the tensor, on the classical side, you get a reduction from two to the system size to two to the entanglement entropy. On the quantum size, we're just on the quantum side, we're exploiting that same reduction to reduce the number of qubits you need from the, from the size of the state to the entanglement entropy of the state. Um, and reading from left to right is basically saying without tensor network techniques, quantum computers kind of have a logarithmic reduction of the amount of memory required to represent an n-qubit quantum state. With tensor networks, that remains true if you use quantum tensor networks. You can still get a logarithmic reduction from two to the entanglement entropy to linear in the entanglement entropy. Um, and then the thing that's nice that lets you potentially utilize this to do useful things is that States, physical states that we care about generally have entanglement entropy much lower than uh, they than the maximum that they could. It's generally much less than the system size. Okay, uh, so I was going to describe now a way that you can extend this to dynamics, and I think um, let's see the. I'll try as I go through this to touch on both of the questions that came up over here. I guess in terms of. Uh, you know, does this solve the problem of these unitaries generally being very difficult to express um, as, as you know, quantum circuits with few with like two body gates? Um, so imagine the following problem, which is that you have some initially correlated state and you want to know what happens if you perturb it in some way. Right. So this is a very canonical problem in condensed matter physics. If you wanted to. Um, like so, so measure like, you know, some properties of the spectrum of a Hamiltonian, you could do it by kind of perturbing an initial state and then looking at the response in time, right? So you can learn all kinds of dynamical properties of a state by perturbing it and looking at its response. Um, so I'll call this kind of problem generally a quantum quench, where you take some correlated state and you want to learn something about it by applying some kind of time evolution to it and then reading what comes out at the end of that time evolution. So, you know, uh, this, so this might describe, for example, like, you know, scattering photons or neutrons or something like that off of the material that you have. In general, this kind of time evolution is some very complicated kind of monolithic unitary that's difficult to think of as a quantum circuit. But there's known techniques that go under the name of Hamiltonian simulation that reduce this kind of time evolution 
to a quantum circuit with a relatively low depth, a depth that won't grow more than linearly with time. Um, and well, okay, there's a lot of like technical caveats to that, but more or less that's that's an honest thing to say, that the depth, you can always represent that time evolution as a circuit that's roughly linear and in, in, that has depth roughly linear in time involving only two qubit gates. So now if you think about this initial state as being, say, uh, a relatively low entanglement state by which you can decompose these tensors into unitaries just by brute force because they're not a very large dimension. Now that, you know, the initial state preparation gets around this problem of these unitaries being complex to decompose because they're just small. And then everything after that has a fixed gate prescription, right? That's low depth in the, in the relevant parameters that you care about is low depth in, in time. So there is no problem of, of how do you actually find the unitary, you know, decomposition of the tensors. It's kind of that's shunted onto the initial tensors being small enough to do it by brute force and everything else being prescribed as a simple pattern of two cubic gates that you don't have to worry about how to decompose. Like Hamiltonian simulation techniques basically tell you how to do that. Now, um, okay, so I'm going to describe now how you can actually get out, uh, like measure properties of this state utilizing these kind of qubit reuse tricks that I already talked about, like measuring and reusing qubits. Um, so if you think you know, naively about um, how hard it would be to take some measurements of the output of this state, like if you wanted to learn a correlation function, you know, you could you could start thinking about it by like, let's imagine just up at the you know left corner here, we wanna make these two measurements. Well, to do that, you know, we obviously have to implement all the gates that got us to that point in the circuit, right? So we have to, um, we have to implement this gate right here, which involves the first two qubits. So we need at least two qubits being injected into this circuit to make these two measurements. But you know, we can't we can't sort of put this qubit into this gate before it's come out of this gate down here, right? So we also need the third qubit in order to execute this gate. And you can kind of work your way back in time and convince yourself that you know you need at least to execute all of these gates that kind of causally influence these two outcomes in order to make these two measurements. And therefore you need at least six qubits going in in the bottom of this state to get these two measurements. The problem is if, if this bottom you know, state is correlated, if it's just some generic correlated state, you can't just inject six qubits of it, right? You would need to build the whole thing. And so the idea of, of using quantum tensor networks here is that if the initial, um, so yeah, so nominally, if it's you know just generically correlated, you would need to prepare the entire initial state, even if you just wanted to measure you know, a small number of, of uh, sites at the output. But if this initial state is a quantum tensor network state, then it's actually much simpler, right? So imagine now I'm gonna draw the same kind of like, you know, circuit MPS type structure, but in a slightly different way. So I have a bond qubit register that propagates from left to right in time. And all of my physical qubits go from the bottom to the top in time. So this little kind of, you know, blue thing down here at the bottom, um, it looks a little different, but it's exactly this circuit up here, right? It's like a register of bond qubits sequentially interacting with all my physical qubits. So that's what's being drawn. That's what's being injected into the bottom of this time evolution circuit. And as a result of that, I can, I can, you know, if I want to build up this state on the bottom, because I'm going from left to right now sequentially, I can, I can output these six qubits right here. And then I can just let the, you know, now the bond qubits are going to live right here. They're going to have just interacted with the sixth qubit and they can just hang out. And while they hang out, I can execute now all of these gates and take these two measurements up here. And after I've taken those two measurements, I can reset these qubits to the zero state, and I can now inject them as these two qubits, which means I'll take the bond qubits that are hanging out here, I'll interact them with this reset qubit and this reset qubit, which were actually these ones. And now I can implement the next slice of the circuit. I can implement all of these gates, and I can take two more measurements, reset those to the zero state, and I can just keep moving my way down the chain in, in kind of slices. So if you think about you know what that means because you always get two out before you need to put two in to execute the next kind of diagonal slice in the circuit. You actually only ever need the initial qubits that you needed to get this triangular region plus the number of bond qubits that you need to represent the initial MPS. Um, so the kind of high level summary of that is, you know, how many qubits are at the bottom of this triangle? Well, you know, what the, the base of a triangle is just proportional to its height. So really the number of qubits is set by the depth of the circuit which is determined by the evolution time that you want to reach. And so 
at the end of the day, the number of qubits you need has two contributions. You get the initial entanglement entropy. That's for the bond qubits that go in here to represent the initial MPS, plus an amount that grows linearly in time. And that's due to the number you need to put in to kind of initialize this first triangular region before you then get to execute all the rest of the slices for free in terms of qubit number. And so the, the cool thing about that is that you also expect the entanglement entropy of the state during a quench to grow at, you know, as some you know, constant from the initial contribution in the initial state, S0, plus some ballistic contribution from the time evolution. So what this is telling you is that this algorithm in some sense is optimal, right? It's, it's giving you, um, it, it's allowing you to simulate a, a quantum quench with a number of qubits that is just linear in the entanglement entropy that is generated during that quench. Um, which I think is kind of nice and in some sense, probably the best you could hope to do. Yeah. Is there a restriction of the correlator to the nearest neighbor, like in the ordering of the MPS? Uh, no, because what you get here, at the end of the day, as you move from left to right, you end up sampling every site. And so from those samples of every site, you can reconstruct any correlation functions you want, even over large distances. Yeah, so there's no restriction like that. And actually, you can even do the sampling at different times in the circuit. They don't always have to be at the end. And you can make, you can kind of, in that way, you can measure kind of um, unequal time correlators using exactly the same kind of qubit reuse tricks. Yeah. So once, so yeah. once you make MPS, then doing MPO is quite easy. Definitely. That is, yeah, that's the point. If Making the MPS, if it's very high entanglement entropy, will suffer from the problem that you were asking about initially, that it might be hard to embed those unitaries, um, those tensors and unitaries using two qubit gates. But if it's a relatively weakly entangled state to start with, so you can just do that by brute force, the application of the MPOs is just a prescribed quantum circuit that's handed to you by whatever, you know, your favorite Hamiltonian simulation technique. So that part is easy. So for example, if you're trying to see dynamics from the quantum state, Making MPS might be super easy, and then doing the MPO is quite cheap. So if it is advantageous on those kinds of situations, yeah, that's right. Initial. Yeah, I think I think I mean it could be advantageous in a number of different situations, but right in general, as long as as long as you're able in some way to represent the initial state you care about, which might be possible either because it's low bond dimension or because you're very clever, even if it's not low bond dimension. As long as you can do that, then you can do the time evolution relatively cheaply with a number of qubits and a number of gates that's only linear in the time of the evolution you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned wow. like, it's still natural to get out of state in this form. So if this is like, let's say it's too big, can you do classically? Could I ever construct these unitaries in the first place then? Could that require a classical Pierce algorithm to bring them in the first place? Which unitaries? The, I'm wondering how these, the these gates here? It is representable as this MPS circuit. It's not given that in my previous algorithm. Probably, well, you might be. So, I mean, one, I mean, one possibility, right, is the initial state. If you're doing a one D quench, is actually very manageable by DMRG, right? You can find, you can find a good approximation to like the ground state of your system. It's the time evolution on top of that that's hard. So, you might imagine doing finding the initial state by some procedure where, like, you you know, you find the tensors through classical optimization, and then you find how to. They're relatively small, so just by brute force, you find how to embed them into unitaries effectively. And that lets you prepare the initial state. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say the advantage is it only when the light code is sort of covering some small fraction of your active system? Yep. And like in when if I then compare that to like doing actual like clusterization and of Hamiltonian and running it on the classical computer, what kind of time does that actually correspond to? It's a great question. So it's a, so this is kind of a key problem that I'll point out on the final slide, which is you know the answer to that. I said that this depth could be roughly linear in the time evolution, but there's a constant prefactor. Or depending on your technique, it could even not be linear. It could be some polynomial in the time. Uh, and say you're you know say you make it linear, there's still a constant prefactor that tells you how many you know rows of gates do I need to do per like unit time evolution in the natural time scale of the problem. And that may be fairly large, in which case there's really no benefit to doing this. Like the backwards light cone will encompass the entire system for a reasonable size system. That could happen. Um, I think there, so 
One place that that definitely doesn't happen is if you're actually looking at like Floquet-like dynamics of a circuit where these gates are kind of maximally entangling, right? So in that case, the classical complexity will grow exponentially in the number of circuit layers if these gates are maximally entangling. And therefore, you'll run out of steam classically at a relatively low depth where you might hope that there's still like, you know, a fair amount of benefit from using this technique. And that's exactly the example I'm going to show on the next kind of couple slides here. But I think the issue of how to make this work for true Hamiltonian simulation, where you, you're not natively handed a circuit with entangling gates, but you're given a Hamiltonian and you decompose it into many weakly entangling gates, that, that that's very much like an open question how well that can be done, I think. Um, I think there are some ideas there and some progress that I can point to, but it, it's not entirely clear how well that can be done. Um, okay. So let me give you a quick example before just kind of wrapping up here. I know I'm almost out of time. Um, so uh, Ellie, uh, who I mentioned, who's at Quantinium, uh, he worked out how to do exactly this procedure for a model called the kicked Ising model. So the kicked Ising model, it basically looks like a transverse field Ising model, but instead of always having the transverse field on, you're just pulsing it on as kind of a delta function periodically. So you're just doing every so often, you just rotate about X by a fixed amount. That's basically while the kind of Ising, you know, ZZ interactions are on. Um, the nice thing about, well, there's multiple nice things about this model, but one uh, is that uh, there's sort of a broad parameter space in this model where because of this structure called kind of dual unitarity, which is not really important here, it's exactly solvable, even though it still can kind of encompass a lot of kind of generic behaviors of quantum systems. So you can make it, um, you can make the dynamics chaotic while maintaining the solvability. And for us, we kind of liked it because you can get, it, it's sort of maximally entangling in some sense. So you can get very fast propagation of the entanglement, which would frustrate kind of classical simulations very quickly in low depth um, while remaining exactly solvable and kind of a nice benchmark for how well the method uh, actually works. And so, um, you know, this, this dynamics is known to be writable as a quantum circuit that looks like this kind of, it's drawn kind of a different way, but it's this same kind of brick wall circuit that I'm showing here with alternating gates between even and odd sites. And so to actually implement it on a quantum computer, you just have to inject a number of qubits proportional to like the base of this triangle shown here. And then you're implementing everything else kind of slice by slice using no more qubits. And so if you write that out as a quantum circuit, it looks like a quantum circuit acting on, there's like one extra qubit for the bond register because we start with the bond dimension two MPS. And then a number of qubits is just proportional to the um, depth of the circuit in order to build this initial triangular region. Um, and then all of these other slices don't involve any more qubits. You just have to go further and further in time in the circuit to get your measurements. Um, and so by, by sort of implementing the circuit that way, I think in the, yeah, we used, so 17 qubits. I think effectively you're simulating sort of a 64. At, we could have simulated larger. It's just if you go out to like very long distances because the initial state's an MPS and it has a finite light cone, there's just no content out there. Like all the correlation functions are exponentially small and you don't care about it. So there's no point in going at the times we reached beyond a 64 site system. But we were able to simulate the time evolution of a 64 site system using only 20 qubits. And it's basically, it you know, it's for all the reasons I just discussed, the number of qubits is really going into the time direction. The more qubits you have, the further in time you can evolve. Um, and going to larger system really just involves running longer uh, circuits. And where we chose to stop, how big we chose to make this, as you can see up here, we just kind of went slightly outside where the light cone was after the final time we could reach with the number of qubits we had. Because outside of that, there's just no information content. Um, yeah. And comment on the properties of the initial state of the classical MPS dimension because this could not be an MPS state, right? Could not be what? It could be not be an arbitrary MPS state, right? It, it yeah, there is a constraint on the initial MPS to ensure that the kind of solvability structure of the dual unitary circuit is preserved. Um, so there, yeah, it cannot be an arbitrary MPS. In principle, this circuit construction can give you an arbitrary MPS, an arbitrary bond dimension two MPS with one bond qubit. Um, but because we wanted to preserve this dual unitary structure, we chose a very specific initial MPS that preserved it. I don't know if that was your question, but the question is what what it is in specific form for MPS. 
Oh, I think it, uh, that is a good question. What are these? I mean, can I remember well enough to give you a detailed answer? I am not sure. I mean, it, um, I think the answer is I would have to like go back and look to give you a good answer to that. But I mean, there's an archive reference as well. It's something fairly simple. Um, but yeah, I just don't remember. Related, quick question. Yeah, I, mean, yes, I know. Is it possible to generalize this to where you are in family conditions? You want to please simulate this for a very long time. Um, I mean, the nice thing about these dual unit research is you can put them on the side and walk space. I, I'm just wondering, like, this, that's one of the yeah, things. that's a good question. And I think so. I can't give a yes or no answer. I guess the answer is I'm not, I don't completely see how to do it but i've been told by people who know a lot about tensor networks that you can uh so i think the answer is yes and i'm not sure but i, I mean miles may have some comment on that i can put him on the spot maybe i don't, I don't know yes. like, it seems like, <laughs> yeah, we'll, no. all right because i mean there's there's all, the only reasons we can't do periodic classically are for very like classical reasons you know that wouldn't affect the bottom of the period of question yeah um so hopefully the answer is yes but we haven't yeah we haven't worked it out or tried doing it um let's see i think the only other thing i guess i wanted to point out well two quick things one you know i didn't even say sorry because i'm kind of rushing at the end but i'm plotting here correlation functions you know in in space and time if you kind of dissect them into little you know slices along the x-axis just to see more quantitatively you can see this nice, you know, ballistic propagation of, um, of you know, the you know along the light cone of the system of the correlations, that out to the longest times we can reach with 19 qubits agrees, you know, within kind of statistical noise on the quantum computer with what you'd predict from this exact dual unitary, uh, you know, calculation of the correlation functions. So, I, what we can say is that at least at this point, the gate fidelities are high enough that we're not limited by gate fidelity doing these simulations. We're really limited in qubit number to what time we can reach. So I think that's somewhat promising in that you don't, you wouldn't imagine you need to go to much deeper circuits than this um, and, you know, much larger qubit numbers before you're doing calculations that are like relatively non-trivial to do classically, which is probably about the best we can really hope to say for any quantum computer right now. Um, so I think there's relatively good hopes of being able to do that as we scale up to larger qubit numbers uh, with the same gate fidelities. And then I'll flash up one, I'll kind of skip the summary because I went over time and just flash up one kind of advertisement slide if people are interested, reach out to me. There are pretty low overhead ways to get access to the quantum computers we have um, for free through like various grant programs. Um, and the one I know best is this Oak Ridge National Lab program, um, but there's also something through Microsoft and I think it's relatively low, like bureaucratic overhead, getting a submission in, and you have the opportunity then to run things. You you would get like direct kind of API access to submit jobs to our quantum computers. So it's a nice way to kind of get your foot in the door and try try running things. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to take any more questions. <laughs>